Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone. Welcome to Junior Down's The Spark. I'm Junior Down. Joining me today is end of life coach and educator, best life, best death, Diane Hullett. Welcome, Diane. Uh, tell us a little about um, best life, best death and how you came to really champion that part of life. A great question, Junia, and thanks for having me on The Spark. I'm, I'm excited to talk about this. It, you know, it sounds funny to be excited to talk about a topic like end of life and death, but I think it is such a powerful transition that every person goes through, and yet somehow in our culture, it's kind of shrouded, and people are nervous about it, scared about it, and, and don't really know how to approach it directly. And I, I think this causes more problems than it solves. So I, I guess, you know, everybody often has a lot of stepping stones in their life that lead them on the path they're on. And for me, I've always been an educator, always been a facilitator and interested in conversation. And a couple of years ago with the pandemic, I decided to get more interested, you know, do some more training, take some more steps in this end of life education piece. And so I signed up for a death doula course. And I think it's interesting that the pandemic really put death forward more for people. It, it, it brought it into the more, I don't want to say popular culture exactly, but just sort of, it began to be talked about more because suddenly there was so much sudden death happening. And I think people were nervous and had, you know, difficult experiences with that. And so it, it came to the forefront. And with that came some really amazing training programs that have been in existence for a long time, but they got a little more press, so to speak. There were some great news articles in the New York Times and other papers about death doulas and about end of life education training. And so I trained with the Conscious Dying Institute, which is based in Boulder, Colorado, where I live. There's also an excellent program called Going with Grace. There's an excellent program at the University of Vermont. There's uh, a woman who has something called Doula Givers. So there are these various ways that you can find training, whether you're a lay person like myself or whether you're already in the medical field or the hospice field. And so for me, a, a really interesting turning point was when my father-in-law was towards the end of his life and we enrolled him with hospice. So hospice sent this non-ecumenical chaplain to us, and I loved what this woman did with our family and with my mother-in-law. She was so present. She was so helpful. She told us things we didn't know about what to look for, signs that were happening with Bob, ways that we might help him find closure, just all kinds of things. And I looked at her one day after we'd met with her three or four times, and I said, how did you get this job? I think I want to be like you when I grow up. And she said, well, I have a master's in divinity. And I had young children at the time, and I tucked that away in the back of my head thinking, a master's in divinity? I, I had no idea that might be something I'd be interested in. So fast forward to my kids being teenagers and me having more time and space and the pandemic hitting. And I thought, okay, now's the time to look this more fully in the eye. So with this training with the Conscious Dying Institute, I learned a lot about looking at my own experience of deaths in my life, the experience of death in our culture. And I really found this niche of conversation and education be, being really the piece for me. So some of the friends in the class that I took, uh, there were about 50 of us in this online course, and some of them went on to do vigil work, uh, doula work, sit with the dying. And that's less the direction that, that I ended up going because I think because I'm just sort of a, an educator at heart. And so my piece has been more bringing forward conversation, bringing forward classes, bringing forward a podcast, 
all as a way to spark conversation. What did you have to change as you started practicing this? What if I had to change on the inside? Yes, the content. What had to be emphasized more or less? I, I think the thing that's interesting is to realize that, you know, there's this way that the time in which you live, you sort of act like this is how it's always been, or this is where it is, what it's like everywhere in the world. But that's not the case at all. So I look at our society in this era and its approach to death. And, and I say to myself, is this the best way? For many people, it's not the best way. It's, um, it's held at arm's length. It's quite disconnected. People feel a lot of fear. Um, a lot happens around a death in a family, often not for the good. There's often chaos. There's often confusion. There can be really intense feelings. Most of this is not what people want. And what's fascinating is that having conversations before that person is dying can really impact how the family experiences that death. And so I think when we're willing to talk about this difficult subject with our loved ones, with our spouse, with our children, it changes the experience both for the person who is going through it and for the family and sort of how that rolls out with, with family members. So, I mean, I'm talking kind of theoretical here, but you know, everyone has a story of a death that they wish had gone differently. And that can range from grandma always wanted to die at home and ended up in the hospital to dad always wanted to be cared for and ended up alone in assisted living and died during the pandemic. There's, there's enormous difficulty around this subject. And so what I bring is this idea that we can change that by talking about it ahead of time, by having more conversation. And what's interesting is sometimes people think that means advanced directives, you know, that that means paperwork and having your will in place. Yes, very important, but that's not the only thing that's important. There's emotional levels to this that are also really important. So asking yourself questions about the emotional side of things and the legacy side of things. Well, we can talk more about that, but, but what I'd like to see change is, is this broader uh, question of how do we approach end of life with some curiosity and some fascination, maybe even instead of fear that keeps it at arm's length. I think about the metaphor of, I, I had a young woman in a class that I taught last fall and she said, you know, the first birth I ever attended was me giving birth to my son. And she said, that seems crazy to me in hindsight that I had never been part of a birth until I had my own baby. And she said, then later I was at the birth of my sister's child. And she said, wow, I was so much more helpful. I had so much more information. I knew so much more. And she said, I feel like death is the same. She said, I want to understand death a little bit closer before it is my parents, my husband, myself. And I thought that was a great way to think about it. How do we make this more familiar so that it's something we can embrace as this huge human transition? So early on in, in Ted and R and my marriage, I told him, should I ever get a bad disease, but even a little disease, I wanted it straight. You know, I want to know the truth because if it was terminal, I had a lot to say to a lot of people and I really wanted the chance to say it. But I'm wondering um, if people, there are other ways to look at it. I don't want to know or, or something. So basically I'm asking you, is the variety of approaches different? Absolutely. I mean, I think this is so individual. It's individual to each person. As you said, you're a person who wants to hear it direct. You know, you want to know what the disease is. You want to, you'd probably be a person who would research a lot about it, talk to several doctors, get information and just face it, right? Because that's who you are. Other people yeah. maybe don't have the resources to do that is one thing, either financial or emotional or the family structure to help support it. Or they themselves are just too afraid. They kind of want to keep their head in the sand. Um, I mean, I'm talking kind of two extremes, but 
the, that's just one aspect of, yeah, I think it's very individual and I think it's very individual per families because how families play out really depends on the makeup of the family and how scattered people are, how connected they are, whether they agree with each other about things. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's very individual work. And at the same time, I feel like it's work that there are some universal things one can say. I wonder if you talk a little about the effect of dying words. So for example, my grandfather died at home and his last words looking at my mother was, I love you. And that she took with her for years and years and years. On the other hand, when I was in my 20s, a girlfriend's dad died and his last words were, is that all there is? And it, it just burdened me <laughs> for her, right? Because it was sort of bitter or disappointed. And so in the course of the course, is there any topic that's discussed like that? Because I always thought last words were somewhat random. I think that's a great question, Junia. I think that, um, again, it's probably so individual, right? It, it's, it's, it, you know, one way to think of it is um, sometimes people say we die the way we live. Well, the fact is there is in some ways no such thing as dying. We're living and then we're dead. So of course we quote unquote die like we live because we're alive. We're doing what we've always done, whether that's, um, you know, joyful curiosity or bitter crabbiness. We do what we do, what we do, right? So I think that um, what I love about the course I teach, so, so typically what I teach is a six week course called Best Three Months. And the premise of the class is in three months, in 90 days, you are going to die. And the way I like to set it up is I say, you know, you have the health you have now, you the age you are now, you live where you live. And in, you know, 88 days, something is going to happen that causes you to die in 90 days. Therefore, what do you need to do in these 88 days that you're aware you have? What are some of the key things that you need to do? And we talk about life in five domains. We talk about the physical life, how you want to be cared for in those 88 days, or how, what you want to do differently than you're doing now. We talk about the emotional life. Are there um, aspects of your emotional life that feel like they need some repair if you knew you were gonna be gone in 90 days? We talk about uh, the practical uh, side of dying. It, when you're dead, what do you wanna have done with your body? That kind of thing. And we talk about spiritual life. What's, what, what are your beliefs? What are your systems for how you wanna go about this? And we talk about your legacy. Are there any projects you want to complete? Are there any things you want to give to people? Any letters you want to write? What's important to you? So I'm boiling those down into some simple examples, but those five yeah. areas are really powerful to talk about. And so when we talk in a group, in a class, we often come up with anecdotes like you're describing, either very powerful last words that have moved people or very um, devastating last words or a lack of last words or just things not going at all how you had in mind, or maybe things going exactly as you hoped they would go for the person who's dying. So I think it, 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 is, it is really powerful. There's also a lot of mystery at the end of life. And, you know, when you get in a group of, a group of anywhere from six to 20 people, at least half of them or more will have stories about something mysterious that happened. Call it mysterious, call it spiritual, um, but, you know, a premonition that someone is going to die, a dream, um, a sense of the person lying there dying, talking about going on a journey, um, them seeing deceased relatives, very, very common, much more common than we're, we're, we even know, because we don't talk about it at a broader level. But when you talk one on one with people, almost everyone has a story. So I think last words and mysterious events, I think are just part of this incredible transition. And there's a great quote, there's a book called Die Wise. Um, and Stephen Jenkinson, the author basically says, how you die is really your last legacy to your loved ones. It has a big impact. That doesn't mean it has to be, um, you know, some kind of extraordinary event, 
but it has an impact. And if you do it with some awareness that there's an impact, then, um, you know, it can make a difference for how family relationships play out in the years to come. It can make a difference for how people feel about the death. It can make a difference for how those last words sit with somebody. And I don't say all that to put pressure on people to think about, you know, being some powerful, elaborate death, but more just to be aware of, of being somewhat um, conscious about what you're choosing as you lead up to that, because you are setting the stage for your own death. And you can do that somewhat deliberately and curiously, or you can just pretend it's not happening. And either way, death won't come any sooner. And either way, it will have impact on your loved ones. Once I was in extreme pain and literally I jumped out of my body and I watched from the ceiling everything they were trying to do. And I thought, what just happened? You know, I'm on the ceiling. And then you hear about people dying and they see a tunnel of light, you know, and then you have Steve Jobs saying, wow, wow. But I talked to a brain fellow once who was giving a lecture in New York and I asked him about that column of light. Oh, he said, they're not seeing anything. The blood to the brain is reduced and that causes that hallucination or whatever. Do you cover aspects like that? I, I do. I mean, and I think that comes down to what do you, what do you believe? You know, what do you personally believe or want to believe? Um, because I think science can have some explanation for it, but I also think there's so much as I said, so much great mystery. There's, there's a wonderful TED talk by a man named Dr. Christopher Kerr. And Dr. Kerr is a hospice doctor in Buffalo, New York. And he, uh, he got into hospice work and he realized that across the board, people were having these experiences. And he tells a funny anecdote in the TED talk where he says that he said to a nurse, you know, I think this patient, I think if we give him some IV fluids and, uh, you know, a, a little bit more time, I think, you know, he's going to be okay, or, you know, live a little while longer. And the one of the nurses said, Nope, he'll he's going to die in the next 24 hours. And Dr. Kerr said, Well, why do you say that? And she said, Well, because he's been talking to his mother, who's dead. And, and he says, uh, Dr. Kerr says, Well, wh wait, I don't think I took that class in medical school. And she says, Yeah, no, there's a lot you missed in medical school. But trust me, when people are talking, to their deceased relatives, and it's quite consistent, the end is near. And that factor was more relevant, so to speak, or more indicative of, of imminent death than all the physical factors that he was looking at. Yes. I think that's really powerful to realize that there are these mystery pieces that are present for humans. And probably there's a scientific explanation for some of it but I'm not sure for all of it, but it probably depends what you believe. Is some part of the course devoted to messages from the other side? So if someone dies, their spirit or something can send some kind of a sign that says in essence, there's either an afterlife or for this moment, I let you know, or how much of that is imagination. What do we know in that area? That's a great question. Well, again, I, I mean, what I bring to this course is a, is a, is information and facilitation. And, um, essentially I, I offer people a series of reflective questions for them to come to their own kind of conclusions about what they want. But again, absolutely across the board, these kind of anecdotes come up a lot and people have talked to mediums, um, I have not personally talked to a medium, but I know people who know people. I could put people in touch with mediums. So I try to run my course in such a way that it's not my agenda about what I think is true, but it's more like space for people to come and bring their fears and their concerns and their curiosities and their experiences and share those with others. And it's, it's really powerful to hear people's experiences. They're, um, there, there are a lot of what I would call near death experiences and experiences of the numinous and the mysterious that everyday people bring. So Diane, um, just to personalize it a tad, I noticed you had done breath work. Could you talk about that and what drove you to try that out? 
Sure, sure. Um, well, my husband got interested in Wim Hof a few years ago. I don't know if you're familiar with Wim Hof. He's also called the Iceman. And he's a very interesting person who has found that cold and breathing make a big difference in how the physical body works. So this is the man who's like climb Mount Kilimanjaro in a pair of shorts, because he believes that we live in kind of a narrow band of temperature and comfort that does not tap into the true resources of ourselves as human animals. So um, my husband got interested in Wim Hof and I just, I'm, uh, I can't say I'm a devoted uh, breathwork person, but I, I know the power of breath and I know the power of uh, being in your body with your breath that does impact your consciousness. You know, it's, it's a form of meditation. And that I think is a way to quiet your mind to come into your body and to experience uh, the senses in a way that we don't always do when we're kind of rush, rush, rush and on our phones and in our calendars and in our heads. So I appreciate it from that kind of angle. Is it something you've experienced a little or a lot? Oh, well, I, you know, I'm really an introvert. So I like all those inner character and, you know, questions about this and that. And I, I think um, that one of the goals in life for me anyway is to, I gave a talk on that once and not until I was 70 <laughs> and I lost a lot of the static <laughs> so the inner person, you know, could shine more. And um, I think that I, I um, found that just really interesting. Uh, now, not everybody you know, here's that music. But for me, etc. I can say at this point, I feel inner harmony and I feel peaceful. I've had all of the good and bad experiences. And what surprised me is when you're older, although I think of myself as sort of energetic and interested in life, still, you become, which I wasn't really clear on earlier, you become the anchor for people going through things for the first time or turbulence or good things. And um, so even though our, our culture tends to favor the young because of change, the value of change and innovation, I think there's, um, if you wish, kind of that stabilizing uh, role. Uh, remember Vance, um, he, I'm trying to remember, he was from Appalachia and a really distressed background. But he had one grandmother who saw and stabilized this odd family or odd by our standards. And he went down the mountain, so to speak, to the other culture. So, you know, there's a, a, a lot to learn. And I'm still that way. You know, I still like new and different. And that's why I like to listen. Because- I love- yeah, I love that about you, Junior, because I think you do, you you have a curiosity and you have a um, an openness to like, okay, what's out there? What does this person have to say that I think really suits us if we can keep that going as we age? Because I think in our culture, aging can be incredibly lonely and it doesn't have to be lonely, but wow, you have to work at it to find ways to create that web of connection. I I interviewed a woman who I I like her book so much. It's called The Essential Guide to Solo Aging. And Sarah Zeff Gerber is her name. Geber, I think there's no R in there. And um, she talked about what you need to, if you're aging with no family or maybe no family nearby, and what you need to do to do that well, the number one thing is to create a web of social network. And it doesn't have to be dozens of close friends. It, it means being connected to your neighbors, being connected to the person at you know, the grocery store when you check out. It means staying connected in these little ways that create this web of humanity around you so you're not just alone in a apartment or home. And I think that's really powerful to know that as humans, that social connection is the number one thing we need. And it's the number one thing we need when we age. Thank you so very much for sharing. You're very persuasive and focusing the light on things that can really expand uh, people's um, perception of life, really. 
and the gift, I always call life a gift, even though sometimes you'd like to return it. <laughs> but really, I do believe it is a gift. And um, I, good work. I'm, I'm glad you put your energy to something that can help so many if they're interested. And, Thanks, Judy. Uh, yeah, um, it'd be I interesting think amongst the people we know and share a love for, and you can tell me later what their uh, attitude is. But I encourage you, and I say to everybody who's tuning in, do something nice for someone you know and someone you don't know, and do it every day. Put positive energy into life. Thank you, Diane, again. Appreciate I love that. Thank you, Junia, so much. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones the Spark. Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.